we are kind of unpacking that the problem is really not the thing, you know, the material thing that can be touched or can be seen, but what it represents, which is the domination of memory, history, and the capture and mummification of time and imagination. So I have like two, two stories, two very short, um, simple stories. And the first one, or before I tell the stories is, I want you to think of how long, how long does memory live? Without reinforcing, yeah. maybe, maybe between seven and 10 years. Um, but then if you had like reminders, reinforcements, visuals, whatever, mm-hmm. I think that would then allow it to last a little longer, maybe like a couple of generations. But then now you have to start thinking about the broken telephone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, maybe I would say that amount. Okay. For me, I think um, it takes seven years. That's the cycle even now. Uh, like, like if you meet me after seven years, I'll be looking different. So the cycle of a human being is about seven years. Even uh, the, the, what do you call it, the credits or loans and all that, mm-hmm. after seven years, you should be forgiven and you start afresh. Yes. I can tell the bankers in the, yeah. <laughs> the bankers in the house. Okay, any other? Any other? I mean, I'm a writer, so for as long as the memory keepers uh-huh. keep and transmit and share uh-huh. that memory. Okay. Any other, any other, Isabel? Yeah, I think there's certain memories like traumas that stay, that stay in the body and even in the, in the genetic uh-huh. informations and that go from one generation to the others. That is to say they stay forever, uh-huh. maybe. So we have the range from like seven years for individual kind of memory and perspectives to forever in terms of ten minutes. How ten years, a hundred years, two hundred years. I said ten minutes if you're drinking Waraji. And <laughs> end of ten sentence. minutes down from seven years to ten minutes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think I asked this question because a lot of the time, for instance in my work when I'm doing oral history interviews, one of the questions people ask me is, how do you know it's true? Well, this, this person said they were in a detention camp for 20 years. How do you know it's true? And I often think that this burden of truth is not mine to prove. Um, sometimes it's about listening and kind of understanding the nuances around, you know, it's not about the dates or the, or the kind of specificities of, of the information, but around the human experience. So the first story is around um, particularly Aboriginal communities in Australia that... Uh, Recently, it was found out, I say recently because modern science has a way of kind of packaging itself as new when things have been existing, that there are songs that uh, Aboriginal communities in Australia sing about times when islands were joined together. So when the landmass was one. This is something that was probably discovered, I think, discovered in the 50s or the 40s. But when the kind of scientific calculation of when these islands were together, um, it dated back to 10,000 years. So just to show you that this kind of memory being preserved in song can go back 10,000 years. And just the kind of capacity of human memory and the persistence of it. The other one is around communities um, in the Amazon that sing poems about where people are buried. So, you know, our kind of burial rights now really depend on grave markers and concrete for remembrance. But what they found out was that the communities and the names of the places in the songs were around 3,000 different points in the forest and none of them was repeated. So this is also like kind of poems and poetry as cartography. And I say these two stories just to kind of bring to our attention the various ways in which memory can exist. Uh, memory doesn't exist because museums and archives and libraries are there. Museums and archives and libraries are there because memory exists in people. Right. And so they facilitate this kind of conversation and this preservation in different forms. But inherently, memory has the ability to persist and to change, but also to resist especially very, very powerful forces. 
So this next session, we are going, we're going to listen to a poem uh, by H.N. Yonga called Memories of Trees. And then after that, we'll have like an interactive discussion on some of the aspects that we've touched on. And then we have the next session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also forgot to say that another thing that is very interesting in the, con in the, in the concept of landscape and memory, for example, in a Kenyan context, is how Kenyans have named and remembered places. So if you, if, you, if you look around Kenya, if you go around Kenya, most likely in certain places you're going to find a place called Kambi or Camp. Kambi are this and this, or just like Camp, and no one knows why it was called Camp. So what we've been finding out, especially researching on the locations of detention camps um, during the state of emergency, many of which were either turned into schools, brought down, or just absorbed into private and public property, is that in as much as the archives, the Kenya National Archives does not have a record of all the camps, the screening camps, detention camps, exile camps, you name it. But if you go to particular towns and someone tells you this place is called a camp, most likely it was the location of a camp, you see. So I've given examples of like, you know, Aboriginal communities and 10,000 years in islands. But I think it's also very telling that this way of language, um, of people naming places, of us remembering key events um, through specific sites, is still very much relevant to our understanding of our history today. Yeah. So Isabel will play us the poem, mm -hmm. yeah. and then we'll have the next session. Thank you. Um, yeah, the poem is from the camera, from the uh, um, author and po poet Ajan Lianga from Cameroon, based in Berlin and a close friend of mine. And I give you a little bit of context um, and read what he wrote about his text. This text holds histories, biographies, visions and references from the Bakweri people of southwest Cameroon, recipes of my great grandmother and grandmother's lives, the trees and graves on lands belonging to my ancestors, thoughts shared in the works of Jason Allen Payson and G.C. Niala, and aspects of my work with the Radical Ruralist Collective. So I'm going to play this. It's himself um, who's speaking. So enjoy. I was raised around trees of diverse sizes, some robust with leaves the size of moving eyebrows when looked upon from the ground upward. They stood like Goliath, towering single-story bungalows, shielding them from unfamiliar elements. Others crept on the face of the earth, picking and contending themselves with what little they could find. They too watched and in perpetual service to land and self where you can find and meet them in isolation, on hilltops, in long abandoned woodlands further away from mortal territories, on chosen human settlements, etc. They had gotten to these places either by coercion or by choice, none of which was a decision of their own. Some were bestowed and saluted with names that planted them deep into the soil. Others were not. Mojoko, Ngawa, Jabeya, Nako, Namondo were the ones I felt most proximate to. They stood at attention, stretched, and lined up on my grandmother's compound. They were not gendered by function, but only by name. They were prescribed names to remind spectators that they too have lineages they must care for. And that somehow they needed to remind themselves of who belonged where for what reason. Some carried foods while others did not. Their significance to place or land did not lie in their ability to act as sources of nourishment nor did it lie in their usefulness to mankind. It lay in something entirely different, something hidden away from man's comprehension. For this reason, they stood upright and bent exclusively towards the sun for guidance. People do not sit idly at the foot of a tree. They sit with purpose at the foot of a tree, rituals are held 
A chicken lays its eggs and feeds its young. The family gathers for online to remember spirits. Here, elders congregate to discuss matters of the land, drawing up plans for their next harvest. It is a woodpecker's medium of choice to knock humans back into realities of their light. It is where the seed in the placenta lives, where a body is made whole again. At a tree's foot, a baby gets its name. It is where mothers pound away plantains, yams, cassava, and pumpkin leaves as they enmesh themselves with desires and hopes. There is something that speaks in a tree. In it is archived the language of land and the taste of soil. In it, things are entangled inextricably. A tree dreams, conjures, and imagines the people and the land it stands on. It has its own body, consciousness, and mechanism. In every country where mouths loomed over our throats, the way of the people is the tree. There are questions like, is she at peace? Or is she simply relieving her loss all over again? When a body is laid at the foot of a tree, does it enter into an alliance with its roots? Can it thereafter travel up its veins? Does a new life emerge? Will it recognize its ancestors? Will it have a tongue of its own? Will it remember its mother's loss? In Bimbia, where my family's origin can be traced, people understand trees. You can tell the number of children a woman has lost, counting the number of trees she lives with. Here, People understand the language the soil speaks. They understand that some sites remain etched in our psyche because they are doused in the sentimentality of a history of our dead. They live with their ears to the ground and make available their bodies to the elements. They hear the cries of crickets that announce the arrival of the sun season. They smell and hear the first drops of rain and the joyful voices of trees that welcome them with open arms. As farmers, they have learned to listen closely and to wade on and stay connected to the earth. They are not simply stewards of the soil. They are harbingers of epistemologies and prophecies. In these prophecies, their bodies, living and dead, have entered into alliances and morphed into new forms. On my grandmother's compound, a second and third mutation happens after death. The second one happens moments before a herbalist pronounces and labels the body of a loved one dead. Just before the first howl that whips a community into a state of mourning, leaves a mother's lips before the community convenes to bear witness to a horrible truth, before the gravity of what has just happened is understood and registered by spectating bodies as a loss, as a deletion of life, a stimuli is set to sail. By the time a mother's body hits the ground in shock, a separation becomes apparent. Previously existing bodily ties are severe, and new parts are forged in memory and truth. Gallons of tears are spent. A day and a sight are chosen. The community convinced again to return dust to where it belongs. The third one happens at the foot of a tree. It begins with the tradition of giving back to the earth that which is alive no more. A body and a seed are lowered into the ground and watered with libation and eulogies. Energies and elements enter into machinery. When a new seed grows through a placenta or a body, another pregnancy announces itself. Flowers on the windowsill bloom, point and announce a new dawn. A new body is registered in a song, a hum, a name, or a place to which it can now be found. 
in between the memories of ourselves and our mother's tears, aliens become temporary, the vanish in the banality of truth. On my grandmother's compound, she has five trees beaming with life and five graves announcing names and dates of birth right next to them. These reflections are not speculative, nor are they abstract by nature. They are actual ways of living and respiring in certain parts of the world. These notions have and continue to be passed down from one generation to the next. Our building is in the corner of Rivera de Curtido. <laughs> Thank you for that poem, Isabel. Is there anyone who wants to respond or to, <laughs> to give their thoughts on it or what we've talked about, basically? I don't know if... Um... There's just this line that really stood out for me, but I only managed to write half of it, that they're not just stewards of the soil, but harbingers of, and then I can't remember what the rest of it was. Um, it was a beautiful poem. Um, I think I was really thinking about, for some reason I was, I'm always thinking about the Zambarau tree. <laughs> And thinking about how, like, at least for me, our memory is tied up in... So when my ancestors would have left, they would have carried the seeds, or the, the actually the plant, the... The, the plant, yeah, the, the... What is it called? Seedling. Seedling with plant shoots. The thing, mm -hmm. the little thing, you know. Um, on the ocean along with them to a new home. And like how that would, the home would not feel like home without that. And then what it is like to create new relationship with this soil as a way, it look, in the planting, it's like creating a new relationship and a recognition of home everywhere you see Jambara trees. Um, yeah, I, my mind is just like kind of spinning, but that's kind of what I was thinking about. Thank you, Alia. Does anyone want to kind of reflect on the poem as well? I feel like this half of the table is giving me stares. Longing stares of just speaking <laughs> from your heart. Um, but uh, two months ago, in some, sometime between April and May, we visited a, a place in Nyeri. Uh, and this is a site, this was, this was um, through a community liaison that we had. We were looking for sites of uh, mass graves, particularly from the period of emergency. And a lot of these mass graves are either found near former detention sites or um, villages. And we found, uh, we found a site that, uh, by all means, is not something that you would think is a mass grave. Either you think there's some kind of alienation or plaque or you know just recognition of what the site holds. And the gentleman that lived on this site inherited it from his father. And so occasionally he has to, when he's farming, he digs up um, bones and he has to rebury them and kind of like resituate them within the land. And his, um, his grandchildren live there as well, and he, he grew up on this particular piece of land. But one of the questions that uh, a colleague of mine asked was, are you afraid of dead spirits? And he said, why should I? They're my friends. They haven't harmed me, and I haven't harmed them yet. Yeah. Yes. 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 You know, we haven't had anything come up within us. And for, for me, this is my... This is my home, and this is their home as well. So that story for me was very telling in the ways in which we are taught also to kind of fear, and how much fear and shame plays a role within the landscape of our memories, and what we choose to forget and what we choose to remember. 
and you talked about indigenous knowledge, you talked about kind of communal ownership. Um, and before we have the next session, which is kind of just reflecting on the day so far, we wanted to have a little exercise. It's like a storytelling exercise. So it's, it's one thing to say that the community owns something, yeah? But how do you really, how do you really see that in practice? How do you, how do you define it and how do you preserve it in a way? So what we're going to do is that we're all going to tell a story. Um, I'm going to start with a line. Let's say there once was a tree. And then everyone just says a random line. It can be based on your life, based just fictional anything. There once was a tree that had a friend. The friend was small but beautiful. And very tall. <laughs> Huge and home for all different type of birds, nets, and and uh, you could see even uh, their babies coming from that net. So wonderful. And out of that tree, there was uh, coming of generations and generations of different birds and different species. <laughs> but then they decided to cut the tree. <laughs> and for a long, for 10 generations, there, was, there were no trees. <laughs> and there was no chance to see the beautiful flowers that it bore. All the old women from the countryside went to the tree and uh, to the former tree and wept. Um, the dildo was very big. I'll lay that one's for you. Can I ask uh, you to speak up? Yeah. That one I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one. That one I got. Carrie, take it away. <laughs> You're a writer, that. The dildo thought of a way to resurrect the tree. Um, and so what they did, the dildo being the they, was um, tap into the mycelium network beneath the trees that was still alive somehow. So suddenly from the stump of the tree there was a shoot. And then the community came up with new rules to protect trees from exploitation. <laughs> And the flowers bloomed and the birds sang. The community found new ways of preserving through song and dance. And the birds copied those songs and those dances and passed them on to the future generations. And every year they would have a party at the same time to celebrate these songs. And yet... <laughs> <laughs> and yet the dildo stayed unthanked for all its hard work. Yeah. It grew upset. Day by day it grew angrier and angrier. <laughs> The dildo, which is a they, <laughs> until one day, <laughs> until one day, the dildo walked back up to the tree with the seven birds and their many children and asked <laughs> what do I do with all this rage? Oh, wow. oh. And the tree started singing a song and the song sounded like <laughs> Th 
thunder and rainbows. And ever since then... And ever since then, when, when people use dildos <laughs> while it's raining, um, if you listen very closely... <laughs> You might hear the old song of the birds. <laughs> I, I don't even think that was a test. <laughs> so, Laura is going to read out the whole story. There once was a tree that had a friend. The friend was small but beautiful and very Mm. Huge and home for all different kinds of birds. You could see even, even the babies coming from the nest. And out, I'm assuming that's the nest, and out of the tree, there was a coming of generations and generations. Different birds and species, but then they decided to cut the tree, cut music. Silence. And for 10 generations, there were no trees. And there was no chance to see the beautiful flowers that grew. All the old women from the court side went to the former tree. Thank you. And wept. The dildo. The dildo was very big. The dildo thought of a way to resurrect the tree. So what they did, so what they did, the dildo, they tapped into the mycelium network beneath the trees. We can bring back that rhythm now. And the dildos were they. You can start humming if you are humming. And suddenly, from the stump of the tree was a shoot. The community came up with new laws to protect the tree. And the flowers bloomed and the birds sang. The community found new ways of preserving through song and dance. And the birds copied those songs and those dances and passed them on to future generations. And every year, they would have a party. Some ululations. <laughs> At the same time to celebrate those songs. And yet, yet, the dildo stayed unthanked for all its hard work. It grew upset. Upset, 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 upset. Day by day, it grew angrier and angrier. The dildo, witches are they. Until one day, until one day, the dildo walked back up to the tree with the seven birds and their many children and asked, what do I do with all this rage? And the tree started singing a song and the song sounded like thunder and rainbows. And ever since then, when people use dildos whilst it's raining, if you listen very, 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 very closely, you might hear the song of the birds. <laughs> <laughs>